Hey everyone. Good morning, everyone. How's it going? Let me know if you can hear me. And I got some more questions on the sticky board, so once we get started, I'm going to take some time to answer those. That'll be useful to you guys. A group watching on campus again. Okay, we'll make sure someone can uh, facilitate any questions if you guys have any of those. All right, I think that everyone mostly mostly here and on the dot. So let us begin. A lot of good questions here up on the sticky board. Let's see if I can answer all of them. Uh, someone said, went back to week eleven. Sorry, no, no sorry is needed. Uh, so statin's mechanism is to increase LDL receptors. Not technically. Um, they inhibit the production of cholesterol in the liver. They inhibit the HMG CoA reductase enzyme. By decreasing cholesterol synthesis, then you uh, cause levels of cholesterol in the hepatocytes to be low, and so they want to get more, so they need to suck that up out of the blood. And so they do that by increasing LDL receptors um, that are expressed. And so by increasing LDL receptors expressed on the surface of the hepatocytes, cause more of it to be taken up out of the blood, if that makes sense. Someone said, so I'm not grasping the concept of non-DHP effects on drugs. You said non-DHPs are CYP3A4 substrates and their inhibitors. How is it that they can be both? Uh, are they metabolized by CYP3A4? And once metabolized, they have actions to inhibit it from metabolizing other drugs? Um, not necessarily. Don't overcomplicate it. Just know. Um, very similar to how someone could be a student at Gannon University, but they could also be like a TA. So they could be like in a teaching role. Things can have multiple roles here, right? So not only can it, uh, in fact, uh, inhibit the enzyme, uh, 
um, th so that it affects other drugs that are metabolized through that. So like statins, for instance, or certain ones. Um, but it also just happens to be metabolized through that enzyme. So even though it's inhibiting its own metabolism to some degree, the, the dosing has already been figured out for that. So you don't have to really be concerned too much with, with that uh, point there. Uh, I think my confusion really came about when you said drinking grapefruit juice, uh, three or four inhibitor will cause rathmol levels to go up, right? Because you can have additional inhibition of that enzyme, right? So it's not just like it's a, is it inhibited? Yes or no. There's degrees to it. So by inhibiting that even further, then yeah, you're going to cause rapamil levels to go and increase there. Okay. Um, then said if a patient's taking a torvastatin, which is a substrate, then it will cause atorvastatin levels to go up, right? So um, again, you can imagine if you have atorvastatin levels set, so say like you're taking 20 of atorvastatin a day, if you add on verapamil, it's going to cause levels to go up. Right. If you add on grapefruit juice, that'll cause it to go up even further, right? Because you can get further inhibition of that enzyme there. Okay. Um, hope that makes some sense. If that does not, let me know. But I think I got the crux of what you were asking there. Um, let's see. Someone's asking uh, regarding iopidate in week nine. Can you explain how iopidate is different uh, than IV iodine contrast agent using CT scans? It's just a different product. Um, it's just different ones that are out there. That just happens to be one of them. That because of the high iodine dying content, it can be used uh, for uh, thyrotoxicosis occasionally there. Uh, someone's getting confused on how this uh, works because MOA seems similar to PTU methimazole, where inhibit steps involved in the production of hormones. I'm curious if it has the same actions as Lugol solution. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the iopidate would work the same as the Lugol solution. You're just oversaturating the uh, thyroid gland with too much iodine, and that inhibits further production there, versus where like PTU methimazole work within the, the thyroid gland itself to prevent production of thyroid hormone. Uh, do you mind me explaining how something made with iodine treats a disease that involves too much T3, T4 production more rapidly than PT methimazole, or is the iopidate get along with PT methimazole like Lugol's is? Um, it depends on the situation. If you have someone who's having like acute thyrotoxicosis, um, who's like you know actively at risk for like I don't know MI or hypertensive crisis or something like that, um, you know using something like PT or methimazole is not going to be super um, useful right then because you just have too much you know, T3 and T4 that's out there. So, you know, is using something like Iopidate or Lugol solution or P2 is going to be definitive treatment right then? Not typically. You're more treating it symptomatically and using things like propranolol that can help with like blocking conversion of T4 to T3, get the blood pressure down, heart rate down. So it's not as clear cut as that. It's not like this is like the one treatment. There's usually a lot of things going on there. Um, would iopidate and methimazole uh, be given IV as in an emergent case? Um, methimazole and PT are only oral, so you would not use those IV, but iopidate would be IV uh, contrast agent there. And lastly, I just want to confirm that like the others, iopidate does not have any effect on pre-existing thyroid hormones that are circulating. It just helps to inhibit overproduction. Yeah, that is correct. So um, preventing new production of T3 and T4 versus helping to prevent conversion over. So Hopefully that made sense. If not, let me know. But thank you for posting questions. It's good for everyone to hear them, I think. Um, so without further ado, I don't see anything in the chat. You guys are being uh, quiet and stoic as usual. I was, I'm assuming most of you are in the group there. So you're all shouting at your screens and I just can't hear. So we'll go with that. Um, so continuing on, I think we finished up the last section, um, and so I can go ahead and continue on with this week's material. Um, so talking about a few other medications we can use to help manage blood pressure here, um, going with the vascular smooth muscle relaxants and then also our alpha blockers, so a couple more classes here. Um, we have alpha-1 receptors that are sitting on our vascular smooth muscle. By inhibiting that, um, you can allow for that smooth muscle to relax. Normally alpha-1 agonism causes it to constrict, which increases blood pressure. Blocking that is gonna allow those muscles to relax. Allows for blood pressure to go down. You get reductions of TPR and overall, um, another thing you can actually end up seeing is a reflex increase in heart rate. This is very similar to what we saw with the DHPs, like amlodipine causing relaxation of the vascular smooth muscle, but also reflexes increases in heart rate. This is gonna be more pronounced with uh, these agents here than we saw with the um, DHPs. We have a couple in this category, including prozosin. Um, and again, these are not going to be great by themselves for blood pressure because even though you're blocking those alpha-1 receptors, you're going to see that like the RAS system gets inhibited. Um, you're going to see that it has very limited effects on its own. But in, if used in combination with like beta blockers and diuretics, then it can be effective as an add-on sort of agent. But these are more like kind of third uh, line sort of agents because 
Toxicity profile is not great. Um, orthostatic hypotension is quite common with these, and so you don't want to give this to like an elderly, elderly patient who's more prone to that. They uh, get up to go walk over to the bathroom or something, they get dizzy, they fall, and then they break their femur or something, right? Um, so that's really what you're trying to avoid with that. Not only that, but also like dizziness and lack of energy. Not great from a side effect profile. So again, not used as commonly as something like an ACE inhibitor, for instance. Uh, as I mentioned, you'll get that mild reflux tachycardia. So again, um, something you can see with that. And then certainly uh, reflux increases in renin, sodium and water retention, all of that, just like I mentioned before. And then impotence uh, can be somewhat common, which makes sense because if you're dysregulating blood flow uh, to the penis, for instance, that can make it difficult to achieve an erection. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of these antihypertensives can lead to impotence. Um, these ones tend to be a little bit worse from that standpoint. Uh, and again, for, in terms of interactions, though, typically it's going to be more of a, um, a pharmacodynamic sort of interaction here, uh, specifically with things like beta blockers. You know, they can enhance that postural hypotension because not only are the vessels now wide open, but now the beta blockers or the beta receptors being blocked can't cause an inf increase in cardiac output. So overall, cardiac output's down, TPR's down. You just can't supply enough blood to the brain, and that leads to those falls that I mentioned there. Um, also be careful in patients with cardiac failure, renal failure, because again, they may not be able to process the drug as well, and then lead to accumulation. So a few other ones that fit into this um, category of alpha-1 blockers, that includes uh, terazosin and doxazosin. Um, some people say terazosin, I don't really care how, how you pronounce it, but as long as it's somewhat close to there. Um, again, similar side effect profiles, similar actions, what we saw with perzosin, no big difference there. Um, sometimes you may actually see these being used for BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia. Um, basically, we have alpha-1 receptors that lie on the prostate that cause it to constrict around the urethra. And so if you can inhibit that, sometimes I can treat that as well. We'll mention that in more detail when we talk about urology next semester, I believe. Um, their benefits include having a longer half-life, so they only have to give them one time a day, which is nice from a compliance sort of standpoint. Uh, the next group here is our central sympatholytics. And so these are going to be drugs that are basically acting on alpha-2 receptors up in the CNS and also on some of these um, receptors called imidazoline receptors. And so basically what these do is they tell the brain to stop producing or stop releasing more norepinephrine from the sympathetic nervous system. So they're decreasing activity of the sympathetic nervous system, which means that's why we call them sympatholytics, right? They're basically decreasing activity from the SNS. And so we're going to see uh, several side effects here that may um, look similar to, you know, some of the other antihypertensives we looked at, but the mechanism is a little bit different here, because overall we're going to be end up seeing in different parts of the brain decreased sympathetic activity. So it's going to have effects on um, mental status, on fatigue, on um, also blood pressure, heart rate, and all of that, as we'll see here. So. Uh, clonidine is sort of like the prototypical example of an alpha-2 agonist here. Basically, what we can see is by activating these receptors, it will then shut down release of things like norepinephrine, which can lead to blood vessels getting less norepinephrine being released on them, which allows them to relax because indirectly sort of alpha-1 receptors are not being activated. And then you can actually end up having some positive effects on that um, vagus nerve here, which will reduce heart rate. We know acetylcholine acting on the muscarinic receptor will then reduce down heart rate there. So what do we end up seeing with these drugs? Well, basically, we're going to be getting uh, decreases in total peripheral resistance. You're going to be getting decreases in heart rate and cardiac output, right? So it's kind of having a balanced effect on both the heart and on the vasculature as well, which can be beneficial as opposed to something like, um, you know, beta blockers mainly having effects on the blood, on the heart versus on the blood vessels as well. Um, so what do we expect to see with these drugs? Well, overall, we're going to get modest decreases in total peripheral resistance and cardiac output. And these tend to work well for all races, ages, and genders. Um, they tend to work decently well. Um, we're going to find that um, in some cases you can use it for monotherapy for hypertension, but uh, it will be limited a bit by some of the side effects we're going to see here in just a moment mainly the CNS effect. So like if you're getting really drowsy or sedated from taking these drugs, not gonna be beneficial if you have to like drive a truck or go to school or something like that. Um, also, you can see sexual dysfunction here. They tend to have a narrow therapeutic index, meaning that even small changes in dose of the drug can lead to some pretty big changes in toxic effects as, as well as therapeutic effects. Um, as an example, clonidine is dosed in like 0.1 milligrams. It's a very small dose you're administering there. 
Um, and small changes in that can lead to big changes from a cardiovascular standpoint. Uh, we also end up seeing this abrupt withdrawal hypertension that can occur, where basically if patients have been on it for a long period of time, there are some uh, changes in um, you know regulation of certain receptors, where if you take the drug away, all of a sudden they can uh, develop really severe hypertension. Uh, very similar to beta blockers, how if you have patients chronically taking that, you don't want to have any abrupt discontinuations because they can get really severe uh, rebound tachycardia and hypertension. Same thing can happen with these drugs here, which can lead to increase or um, incidence of MI, um, stroke in some cases. So again, this is another group of drugs you want to taper off slowly. Uh, two main ones we'll talk about here include uh, clonidine. This is probably the most common one you're going to run into. Uh, for the most part, again, it is um, very handy, uh, sometimes a monotherapy, sometimes as an add-on to other drugs there. Um, acutely, you can actually see blood pressure go up a little bit, but this will be short-lasting. Uh, typically, you're going to see an overall decrease in blood pressure for those patients. Um, and then you may see some increases in glucose, but it's usually pretty mild there. You just have your patients watch for that if they are diabetic. Uh, some other benefits you're going to see here is you get decreased ADH secretion, which we know is helpful to getting rid of more water. Um, it does put the kidneys in a state where they do want to hold on to that, so it's going to increase renin release. Um, so by giving this with a diuretic, you hopefully can help to mitigate some of that and help to retain those blood pressure lowering effects. The biggest thing, though, is going to be the sedation you see with these patients. Um, and again, that may, may be... You can develop some tolerance to that over time, um, but it may be problematic, especially if you have like an accidental exposure, um, like a kid gets into this. You see that quite commonly, uh, or for patients that have to go and go to work, for instance. Um, some cases we also use clonidine for its analgesic activity, and this actually helps us to re require less opioids for patients who are like post-surgery and things like that, which is nice. Uh, some other things, as I mentioned, the withdrawal reactions may be quite severe. You can certainly see orthostatic hypotension develop with this group of drugs here. Um, impotence and bradycardia are also somewhat common. Makes sense based on the mechanism we're seeing. Wamfacine is the other drug in this category here that works very similar to clonidine, but the potency of it is less, meaning you're going to find um, you know, less clinical uh, you know, utility here, but also side effects are going to be uh, less pronounced. You're going to see less sedation, um, less strong of a withdrawal syndrome and all of that. It's basically a weaker version of clonidine, essentially. Uh, and then the next group here we have are the direct vasodilators. These are going to be drugs that work directly on the blood vessels to cause them to dilate. Um, overall, you're going to get arterial dilation, decreased total peripheral resistance, and all the same uh, reflex mechanisms that you would see with something like the alpha blockers, like prozosin. Um, so you're going to see tachycardia, increased cardiac output, a lot of increase in renin release. And so um, that does limit how useful these drugs are overall. And in fact, they end up developing a lot of um, reflex mechanisms that make the drug less effective over time. That tachyphylaxis that we sort of mentioned, I think back towards the beginning of the class here. Three drugs in this category here, we have hydralazine, minoxidil, and nitroprusside. We tend to find that they um, have very limited effects on the veins, as you'll see. Um, these are gonna be more working on the arterioles, uh, as you can see on the chart here. I don't really care if you know it's one plus or three pluses, but just know kind of what effects you're expecting to see here. Uh, and again, the more strong of an effect it has on the arterioles, the more of a sodium retentive sort of effect you're gonna get here. Hydralazine is relatively weak versus minoxidil being quite strong. Um, nitroprusside here tends to be a little more on the balanced side, so you see less sodium retention, which is... So typically we're gonna be either using these for more chronic hypertension, in addition to things like beta blockers and diuretics, like hydralazine, and sometimes minoxidil, but I'll talk about what we use that more uh, for more commonly in just a moment here. And then for hypertensive crises, say someone coming into the ER, the ICU, this is where nitroprusside comes into play here. It's typically an IV infusion. Hydralazine is um, not really clear on the mechanism for how it works, but we do know that it can do things like increase uh, cyclic GMP, which increases nitric oxide. This is a direct vasorelaxant. Um, it may have some effects with things like calcium movements, which may be beneficial for its effects on the vascular smooth muscle there. Um, one thing to note with this, though, is that um, it undergoes what we call endocetylation in the liver. And so that is something that um, people tend to either fall into uh, fast acetylators, intermediate acetylators, or slow acetylators. And sometimes it's difficult to determine who's more likely to be one or the other. Um, typically, Caucasian white patients tend to be more likely to be uh, slow acetylators, 
But again, you can't just look at a person and be able to tell right away. Um, what sort of effects that has will dictate how well the drug uh, works for a patient. So if someone is a slow acetylator, then they don't get rid of the drug as quickly, meaning the levels build up and you're more likely to see some of the toxicity here, right? You're more likely to see things like headache, dizziness, flushing, hypotension. If you have someone who's a fast acetylator, they get rid of the drug too quickly and the drug may not be all that effective for them, okay? Uh, people in the inter intermediate category, they, the drug works just like normal for them. Um, another thing you run into as well, which is a particularly unique thing here, is this hydralazine lupus syndrome. So this is more for patients who are on it for a long time, they're taking a big dose. Uh, women tend to be more likely affected by this. Um, and if they're a slow acetylator, which Caucasians typically are more likely, um, then you're gonna find that they can have a buildup of hydralazine and they can come in complaining of like that butterfly-like rash or the other signs and symptoms of lupus that's related to the buildup of metabolites of hydralazine. So if you see that, it's probably a good reason to either discontinue the drug or switch them to something else if you can. Um, things that might be contraindicated in would be things like coronary artery disease. Uh, elderly patients don't do very well with this. They typically have a lot of orthostatic hypotension just due to that strong vasodilation you can see there. And then um, ischemia might not be great because by causing that strong reflex tachycardia, as you're dilating those vessels, you can increase the workload in the heart and can lead to myocardial ischemia. Uh, another thing to note what as well, it can turn the stools black. This is important to warn patients about since um, uh, that may be indicative of GI bleeds. And so you don't want your patient to think they have a GI bleed when really it's just a normal side effect of hydralazine. Finally, we have minoxidil. This one actually works by um, causing hyperpolarization of the vascular smooth muscle. Basically, it opens up all these potassium channels uh, and leads the, the muscle cells more, uh, having a harder time contracting. That's what leads to the low blood pressure seen with this one. Um, this one's not great as an antihypertensive and really should only be used for like third, fourth, maybe even fifth line sort of therapy there. Um, you can see arrhythmias associated with it. You can see myocardial ischemia based on the reflex effects on the heart. Not great for that. But what we do see for it is actually uh, this hypertrichosis. Actually increases hair growth basically everywhere if you're taking systemically. And so we realized that early on and so started using it for topical application. And that's actually where you get Rogaine from. And so typically, you know, you can give this on top of the head and it allows for maybe better blood flow to the follicles, more hair growth. Um, so good from that standpoint, but not really great as an antihypertensive. However, you may find some people are using maybe large amounts of it, um, may see some absorption. You can see some cardiovascular effects from the drug, even if you're only applying it to the scalp. And then finally, nitroprusside here is a uh, direct vasodilator that um, actually interestingly has one nitric oxide molecule and then surrounded by five cyanide molecules. And cyanide is actually pretty toxic itself, but the doses we're administering, it tends to be pretty minimal for the most part. But it's nice because it has a balanced effect between the veins and the arterioles there. Um, most often you'll see like, like a nice EU use, for instance. Um, you can see some cyanide toxicity. This is mainly for people who have maybe liver dysfunction. Uh, and so in order to prevent that, we will give it along with a drug called sodium thiosulfate. And that helps the liver to process it more effectively and get rid of that cyanide. However, some people with renal dysfunction can have a buildup of that byproduct called thiocyanate, and that can lead to its own toxicities there. So typically, if you can give this to people for relatively short courses, that's beneficial because it helps to prevent buildup of these uh, metabolites here. So how do you manage patients with blood pressure, uh, hypertension? Basically, um, you know, in terms of drug selection, the guidelines have not changed a whole lot in recent years here. Um, but basically, general goal is to get them under 130 over 80, especially if they have things like chronic kidney disease or diabetes. Um, in terms of drug selection, for the most part, for black patients, uh, with or without diabetes, you want to start them off on something like either a thiazide or a calcium channel blocker. They tend to respond better to that due to their more salt retentive sort of states, okay? Um, for non-black patients uh, with or without diabetes, you wanna consider starting off with really anything, a diuretic, calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor, any of those are perfectly reasonable. But certainly for patients um, with diabetes, I'd certainly give a strong consideration to using an ACE inhibitor for the kidney protective effects. And they already have existing chronic kidney disease, then definitely an ACE or an ARB would be recommended for them, okay? So again, there's not one cookie cutter approach. Everyone gets the same drug. You just try something, see how they respond to it. If their goal is not achieved within a month, you can either go up on the dose of the med that they're already on, 
or try adding something else from a different class, right? So again, you don't want to use an you know ace plus an arb because they kind of do the same thing. You don't want to use amlodipine plus um, the ties them because they're kind of doing the same thing. So again, make sure it makes sense based off the mechanisms you're going with. All right, so that's it for hypertension. Now let's go into um, kind of switch gears a little bit and start talking about angina and how this uh, develops in patients, especially those with long-standing hypertension. Um, basically, ischemic heart disease is really anything where our oxygen supply demanded by the heart is being is outstripping the supply that we can give it, which is usually due to atherosclerosis or some other uh, blockage of uh, getting blood to the heart. And so that can lead to things like acute coronary syndromes, like unstable angina or acute MI. Um, you can see chronic stable angina, which is mostly what I'll be focusing on here today. And again, that angina is just manifestation of that ischemia, right? Your heart's trying to tell you that I'm not getting enough oxygen uh, and we need to do something about that, right? And so again, you can see that there is, again, a supply and demand sort of uh, analogy here to be made, whereas things that increase oxygen requirements include like the heart rate, uh, how fast your heart's beating, how uh, contractile it is, the stronger the squeeze, the more oxygen it requires. And then on the demand side, or the supply side, I should say, has to do with are you getting enough oxygen to the hemoglobin? Do you have enough hemoglobin to even carry it to the heart? Um, what is the coronary flow like? You know, things like that all are going to be playing a role. You have to have a balance here, otherwise the ischemia develops. So in terms of demand, again, as I, uh, as I mentioned, heart rate, contractility, and then the wall tension within the ventricles are going to have the biggest roles to play here. And so you can find that the systolic or the intramyocardial wall tension is mainly affected by things like ventricular volume and pressure. Uh, and this is going to be a function of both preload and afterload. Preload basically being how much uh, fluid is coming back into the heart that is going to be filling it up. So the more volume coming in is going to cause an initial stretch, which increases pressure. Uh, and then the afterload, which is the pressure the ventricles have to pump against to get blood out and into the aorta. So the higher the afterload, the harder it's working to pump against that, okay? This is all increasing workload on the heart, which is leading chronically to things like hypertrophy, which is again making them stiffer and less contractile and things like that. This is kind of the initial development of things like CHF over time. So as I mentioned, angina is that latent manifestation of ischemia that can occur really with any degree of stenosis. It also has to do with how clamped down those coronary vessels can be as well, as you'll see. Um, but certainly as uh, these veins get more and more stenosed due to atherosclerosis or maybe due to an acute blockage, um, you know, basically that's what we're going to be seeing here. And so hopefully we can get this treated early because, again, with ischemia, time is tissue. You don't want that tissue dying off on you because it is not really able to able to recover. You can have something called vasospastic or variant angina, and this is more so due, uh, you'll see this more like younger patients typically that don't have a lot of atherosclerosis going on, but basically this can occur due to sort of transient um, vasospasm. Basically the vessels will spasm down and constrict blood flow into the heart. Um, and you can actually even see ST segment elevations for some of these patients here. Um, the management of this is going to be a little bit different because, again, their issue is not necessarily coronary blockage. It's just due to the vessel squeezing down too hard, and we'll see some ways we can manage that. So certainly there's a lot of risk factors, some things you cannot change for your patients, but some things you can. So, for instance, if we can get them to stop smoking, uh, get their diabetes under control, have them lose weight, all that can be very beneficial to decreasing the risk of progressing with further coronary heart disease and hopefully prevent them from getting to ischemic complications, right? or help to try to mitigate what they're having already. And our main goal is to try to improve their quantity of life, right? Try to prevent them from having an actual acute coronary syndrome there. And from a quali uh, excuse me, quality of life standpoint there, if we can try to prevent them from having symptoms or relieve the acute symptoms they're having, then that's going to be our goal there as well. Notice here, there's going to be drugs that are good for preventing symptoms and drugs that are good for relieving acute symptoms. You need to know the difference between those um, because some of these are gonna be taken chronically to prevent symptoms, while others will be taken very acutely to treat that. And so again, patients may need to be on both, but you gotta know the difference and what they're used for. So how do we decrease O2 demand? Well, if you can decrease heart rate, decrease contractility, and decrease that wall tension, and decrease how much O2 the heart actually needs from every beat to beat. In order to increase supply, well, increase the coronary blood flow. 
right? The best way to do that is to go in with a catheter and try to open those vessels up, right? Give them the, the rotor rooter treatment, so to speak. Um, but, you know, from our standpoint, if we can try to prevent blockages from occurring or if we can do things to stabilize those plaques, that's also going to be very beneficial, okay? And then, of course, modify any re reversible risk factors. So I'm not going to get much into the revascularization process because, again, that's outside of my scope. But certainly we're going to talk about the pharmacotherapy. We'll talk about antianginal drugs, and then we'll talk about uh, vascular protective agents as well. So things that all these patients need to be on in order to help them live for longer, essentially. So looking at um, things that can decrease heart rate, contractility, and wall tension, this is where we're going to get into our calcium channel blockers, nitrates, which will be a new set of drugs for us, and then beta blockers. So again, a lot of this is going to be review from last week because we talked about most of these drugs already. And then in order to increase coronary blood flow, we're going to see our calcium channel blockers, nitrates, and then some of our antiplatelet drugs that we cover back towards the beginning of the class, aspirin and clopidogrel. So our antianginals are really designed to help us improve exercise capacity for these patients, make sure they can do more stuff before their chest pain sort of kicks in, right? And so we can uh, hopefully reduce those exercise-induced ST segment changes you can see, especially like on stress tests and stuff, and decrease their uh, frequency of symptoms here. Okay, So things that can do that, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, both dihydropyridines and non-DHPs, and then our nitrates. All these can help out with that. So we'll look at those in more detail here. So starting off with the beta blockers, how might these help to treat angina? Well, it makes sense if you look at what their actions are. They decrease heart rate. So less O2 demand there, decreased contractility, so less uh, demand there. And then in terms of uh, systolic wall tension, it's gonna have kind of a mixed bag here. It will reduce systolic blood pressure, but it doesn't really do anything to diminish LV volume. So if anything, you have a heart that has longer to open up and allow for more blood flow to come in, the LV volume actually does go up in a bit. So more so you're gonna find that uh, beta blockers work on the heart rate and contractility. That's the main effects you're gonna see here in terms of antianginal activity. Um, from the supply side, nothing really there. It doesn't really help out with more oxygen getting to the heart. So typically for these patients, this is first line for them. Okay. So unless they have a contraindication, this is going to be first line therapy for those patients. Um, this is good, especially if they have coexisting conditions that necessitate use of a beta blocker. So if they have things like supraventricular arrhythmias, if they have heart failure, if they're post MI, all of these things are very helpful to have beta blockers on board for because they help to reduce mortality. And so beta blockers are typically first line for these patients here. Um, remember that there's sort of delineations between our first, second, and third generation beta blockers. So remember if they have asthma or something, typically a beta one selective or second gen drug is gonna be used there. Um, you know, but any of these could work as antianginals. It just depends on the patient and if they have any contraindications to receiving one of these. So what are contraindications? Well, obviously if they have low heart rate, low systolic blood pressure, uh, AV block, or if they have any kind of decompensation of heart failure that may be there, don't want to use a beta block. You're going to worsen all of those things by giving these. And then obviously you want to be very careful in patients that have reactive airway disease like asthma, uh, the diabetes that can be worsened there. You know, all these make sense based off kind of what we talked about last week. In terms of adverse reactions, just like you might expect, hypotension, bradycardia, sexual dysfunction. Remember, nightmares happen more so for those really lipophilic beta blockers, things like propranolol that um, get into the CNS. Um, and again, careful with patients who have peripheral vascular disease because you get worse than things like claudication based on the effects that it has on the vessels there. Okay. Um, remember not to uh, have too rapid a discontinuation of beta blockers because you can see that reflex increase in heart rate and um, by seeing that dramatic increase in heart rate, that can cause the ischemia that leads to the MI, which is why I want to be careful there. All right, switching gears then, we have our calcium channel blockers. We're going to see there's very different actions depending if we're talking about DHPs versus non-DHPs here. The hydropyridines, they work mainly on the vessels. So the biggest effects you're going to have is going to be on systolic blood pressure. Okay, By reducing that, you're decreasing afterload. The heart does not have to pump as hard against that pressure in order to get the blood flowing, right? Um, in terms of other actions here, if anything, you can actually see an increase in heart rate, which is not what we're looking for. We'll talk about how to mitigate that in a moment. Doesn't really have any effect on contractility and really no effect on LV volume, okay? So DHPs are gonna be more specialized versus non-DHPs you're gonna see really has good effects for most things. So decreasing heart rate, decreasing contractility, and decreasing systolic blood pressure, okay? 
not no real effect on LV volume, but very good. And you can kind of think about DHPs, I'm sorry, non DHPs and beta blockers as having pretty similar effects to one another in terms of anti anginal activity. Okay. Other benefits here in terms from a supply side standpoint, especially with the DHPs, is you're going to get some dilation of areas with their stenosis, a little bit there, or if they're having vasospasm, like that variant angina I talked about earlier, this can help to relieve that. Okay. And again, breaking down the non-DHPs versus the DHPs together, you can see again how their actions sort of um, line up with one another. If anything, the DHPs are going to cause an increase in heart rate, which is why we don't use these for monotherapy for angina. Okay, these are going to be add-on therapy versus non-DHPs can be used by themselves for angina because again they cause decrease in systolic blood pressure, they decrease heart rate and contractility. They're really good kind of across the board. So where do we use these? Basically, if you have a patient who could not get a beta blocker, either due to um, side effects or due to um, any other kind of intolerance, they can't get a beta blocker, then you can start them off on a non-DHP, okay? Um, so you could use a non-DHP by itself. If you have a patient who's on a beta blocker, but they're still having symptoms and you'd like to add them, give them something else on top of that, then you could use something like a DHP, okay? And then they may also be used with long acting nitrates, which we're going to get into in a few minutes here. Okay. So either non DHPs by themselves, or if you have a patient on a beta blocker, you can use a DHP in addition to that. But keep that in mind because I can ask you a test question that says, okay, patients on this regimen, what would you add on next? And so you got to be able to figure that out. So don't mix non DHPs and DHPs together because again, there's too much calcium channel blockade, but you could do a beta blocker plus a DHP, and that does make sense. Again, this is better for patients who have vasospastic angina, particularly with a DHP. Uh, this is good for patients with um, asthma, diabetes, all of that. So if they, again, if a contraindication of beta blocker, non-DHP is a good option for them, okay? Again, uh, and typically avoid short acting agents. This tends to bottom out their pressure, which is not great in terms of coronary blood flow. So avoid stuff like nifedipine. Amlodipine is a really good option though. So contraindications are gonna be pretty similar here with, um, between beta blockers and non-DHPs. So if they have low heart rate, they have low blood pressure, um, if they have heart failure, you really want to avoid non-DHPs for the most part, uh, either seen by acute heart failure or with ejection fractions are less than 40%. Um, so avoid those, right? The only real contraindication for a DHP is going to be the low blood pressure there because again, it doesn't have any direct effects on the heart. Uh, in terms of precautions, don't use a non-DHP plus a beta blocker that would just cause too much bradycardia and AV block. Uh, and then watch out for the CYP3-4 interactions if they're taking a non-DHP. Obviously, adverse effects are going to be all the flushing we talked about, constipation, peripheral edema that can develop there, especially more so the peripheral vasodilator effects are going to be seen more of the DHPs, obviously, as we talked about last week. And then in terms of monitoring, you know, just see how their symptoms are going. Are they improving? Are they the same, getting worse? And obviously, you're looking at heart rate for the non-DHPs there. So uh, the new group of drugs I want to talk about here are going to be the nitrates. And so basically nitrates are anything that donate nitric oxide. Uh, and again, this is not nitrous oxide. It's not laughing gas. It's nitric oxide. We'll be donating this uh, to the vascular smooth muscle and is going to help with the conversion of uh, guanosine triphosphate to cyclic GMP. Okay. Cyclic GMP down the line here is going to decrease cytosolic calcium. So less calcium getting into the cell and it leads to smooth muscle relaxation leads to vasodilation, leads to low blood pressure. This is also effective in the coronary vessels, which allows them to dilate, allows them to have more blood flow coming through. So really, nitrates work better on the supply side than they do on the demand side, okay? Another important thing to consider here too is, well, how do you get rid of cyclic GMP? Well, you get rid of that through an enzyme called phosphodiesterase, and in particular, PDE5. This is gonna be an important uh, enzyme to remember because if I have nitric oxide being do uh, donated by my nitrates, and I'm also inhibiting the breakdown of cyclic GMP by inhibiting PDE5, you're gonna get way too much blood pressure um, uh, reductions. So that's gonna be an important drug interaction we're gonna talk about in just a little bit. What drugs do that? Well, basically uh, the drugs we use for erectile dysfunction like sildenafil and tadalafil inhibit PDE5. This is going to be a very important interaction you want to know about, and I guarantee it's going to come up on the test. Don't mix your nitrates plus your medications for erectile dysfunction. Don't mix these two together because you're going to get profound hypotension for your patients. 
And again, if they have such low blood pressure, they can't even perfuse the heart in the first place, then that worsens ischemia, right? So short-acting nitrates we have here is nitroglycerin, right? Nitroglycerin is typically either given for a quick acute treatment of chest pain. So either as a sublingual tablet or as a sublingual spray I can give here. Now, remember, this is for acute treatment of angina. A beta blocker is not going to do that. It's going to be better for prevention of symptoms. Calcium channel blockers were better for prevention of symptoms. This is the first thing we've seen now that's acute treatment. And so you tell patients, okay, if you have chest pain, go ahead and take one, place it underneath the tongue. Don't chew it. Don't swallow it. Just underneath the tongue. Allow it to absorb. Uh, if you have not got relief after five minutes, then take another one and call EMS. They can take these every five minutes or so. The problem we used to run into is we would have them take three doses five minutes apart, and then if that did not fix the problem, then they would call 911. It's not great because time is tissue. They have all the active ischemia going for 15 minutes. That's 15 minutes you could have saved by getting EMS providers to the door quicker. So if they don't have relief after five minutes, have them call 911. Um, again, warn about orthostatic hypotension. Have them be careful of standing up, get up too quick. They can, again, because those vessels are dilated, not just in the heart, but elsewhere, they can decrease cerebral blood flow, which can lead to dizziness and falls. Nitroglycerin itself is also um, quite volatile, meaning it's not very stable in the presence of air or uh, water. And so uh, we want to make sure they leave it in the original packaging, especially this little tablets here. Let's have a concern with the liquid since it, you can't really move it from container to container. But keep it in the original container because this will keep it airtight, keep light out, and will prevent it from uh, degrading the drug. I've seen some cases where patients will take um, either a degraded drug or really out-of-date drug, and they'll take it, and it doesn't um, treat their chest pain because there's no nitroglycerin left there. Very little is left. So make sure they replace their packaging or replace their, uh, their tablets every three to six months. Even if they haven't used them all, Go ahead and replace them because, again, we want to make sure they have really good effective stuff working here. This is one of those few instances where the um, expiration dates on drugs are actually important. Um, most of the time you'll see that's not necessarily the case, especially for things like, you know, stable tablets and things like that. But nitroglycerin does not fall into that category there. All right. Uh, they also have long-acting nitrates, and these are better for prevention of symptoms, as you're going to see here. Um, so they're basically going to be used as add-ons to something like a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker um, if their symptoms are not managed with those drugs by themselves, okay? So you could have a patient who's either on a non-DHP and then you add on a long-acting nitrate or maybe they're on a beta blocker and a DHP and then you add on one of these as well. These are typically second or third line add-ons. Uh, we don't use them as monotherapy because they tend not to have as much efficacy as something like a beta blocker. We have a few agents here. We either have um, oral forms like isosorbide mononitrate and isosorbide dinitrate. Um, notice here, we're gonna be dosing these so that way they're lasting about 12 hours throughout a day. I'll mention why that is in just a moment. Uh, and then we also have some topical varieties of nitroglycerin that you can apply. Um, things like nitroglycerin paste. Uh, there are uh, patches you can also apply as well. Here's an example of what the ointment looks like where you can basically apply it based on the dose you wanna give, which would be based on inches. Um, and you basically slap that onto the skin. Notice here that you want to have a period of 12 hours on and 12 hours off of the nitrates. You don't want them that be exposed to it 24 hours a day because that leads to a phenomenon called tachyphylaxis, where basically the body stops responding to the drug if they're exposed to it 24 hours a day. So when they do have acute chest pain, they can take their sublingual nitro, but it's not going to do anything for them. By giving them 12 hours on, 12 hours off, it allows the body to have a half a day to sort of recuperate, get back to baseline, and then the drug will be effective again. And typically, you want to make sure they're doing this when they are most active. So, I mean, typically during the daytime for most patients, but some people are active at night, and so maybe that 12-hour period is later on in the day for them, okay? So make sure they wipe off any of the previous doses that are there whenever they're adding on a new one. Make sure the skin's nice and clean. And you're going to see there, again, 12 hours on, 12 hours off for the patch as well. So it's going to be ubiquitous with any of the long-acting nitrates you see here. Um, beware, you can see some flushing, postural hypotension, reflux tachycardia. It's all pretty well seen with um, these nitrates here. Again, the reflux tachycardia can be mitigated because you're not using these by themselves. You're typically adding this onto like a beta blocker, which is already decreasing the heart rate in the first place. So that's sort of, sort of uh, mitigated at that point. Um, also be aware of like 
healthcare providers or family members are giving this stuff, make sure they're wearing gloves to prevent the nitroglycerin from getting absorbed through the skin because it can actually lead to some pretty nasty headaches for them as well if they accidentally get exposed. So as I mentioned with the nitrates, just be aware that tachyflax is phenomenon. Um, this is why we do 12 hours on, 12 hours off. We call that the nitrate-free interval. And that's going to be during the period of time where they have the least amount of symptoms, typically when they're asleep. Okay. In terms of adverse reactions, or I'm sorry, contraindications to nitrates, again, things like aortic valve stenosis, obstructive cardiomyopathies. This basically leads to a state where your vessels are dilated, but the heart can't pump enough blood to uh, have good perfusion because there's a blockage here, either through stenosis or some sort of obstruction, right? One thing to note there. And then do not use this um, nitrates concurrently with phosphodiesterase inhibitors. So if someone has a history of pulmonary hypertension or erectile dysfunction, they're on one of these three drugs, you do not want to use this in addition to nitrates. It's absolutely contraindicated uh, because of the fact that the two together cause way too much vasodilation. You can end up seeing severe hypotension, lead to stroke, MI, all of that. And again, you may be thinking, well, when would I ever run into a situation where a patient is using both sildenafil plus a nitrate, right? I'll tell you, and again, this is why it's really important for EMS providers to ask the question prior to giving nitroglycerin to these patients with chest pain when they respond to a call. Uh, imagine you have, uh, say, a middle-aged gentleman who may has a history of coronary artery disease and who has erectile dysfunction, right? So he's going out on a date with his partner for the night. Um, you know, he goes ahead and, and takes a sildenafil, uh, to help him out with the evening activities. Um, he is being um, uh, physically active, and all of a sudden his chest pain comes on, right? So his instinct might be to take a nitroglycerin to treat that chest pain, but again, the two interacting together can lead to really profound hypotension, lead to syncope, um, can worsen the um, uh, ischemia. So again, do not mix these two together, and EMS providers have to ask, or need to ask, as along with you as a medical provider, to see if they've taken one of these drugs recently because you can see uh, the two that will definitely interact. You don't want to have that uh, medical error on, on your hands, right? So overall, when you're comparing these different drugs, you want to kind of think about the type of patient you're dealing with and what might be a good first-line agent, what's a good alternative, and maybe what to avoid depending on the situation. Uh, so for instance here, if they have hypertension, beta blockers fine as a first-line agent for them, right? Or using a non-DHP as an alternative. Um, but how about, for instance, if they have something like asthma? Well, you can utilize something like a non-DHP non, uh, non or something like a cardio-selective beta blocker, meaning uh, metoprolol, tenolol, something like that. Um, but note here, they want to avoid non-cardio-selective beta blockers. Okay? Or if they have, for instance, um, decreased LV function. We're going to talk about CHF a little bit more later on, but we're going to see that beta blockers are really good for those type of patients. We may need to add on something like amlodipine. But you probably want to avoid non-DHPs, right? Because they can actually worsen their LV function even further. So be aware of that. I might ask questions on the test saying, hey, they've got these conditions here. What's going to be the best first-line therapy? What's a good add-on therapy based off what they're already on? Things like that. Again, recognize what do we use for acute treatment of anginal symptoms, which is short-acting nitrates, nitroglycerin, and what do we use for long-term prevention of symptoms? It's our beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and long-acting nitrates, right? So what are some other things we should be doing for these patients as well? Um, these are the vascular protective things we can do for them. And so this includes your ACE inhibitors. And these should be used really for anyone with a history of coronary artery disease, if they have diabetes, left ventricular dysfunction. Uh, they all need to be on ACE inhibitors, right? And again, this can be useful to um, help manage patients' hypertension they may have as well, okay? Um, note here, they don't do anything about oxygen consumption. They don't relieve any symptoms of angina. Uh, but the big benefit here is they may prevent progression of CAD. They should also um, prevent things like LV dysfunction over time, the, uh, the remodeling that occurs there, which can help to improve function over time. Um, and they are good for the kidneys in diabetic patients. So there's a lot of reasons for most of these patients who have ischemic heart disease to be on an ACE inhibitor already. Um, you may need to consider combination therapies for some of these patients here. This is going to be typically um, where if they're on a single agent, they don't get enough relief of symptoms, um, where you may need to add on something else. So again, if they're on a beta blocker, a non-DHP is not going to be good, right? Because again, it's going to cause too much suppression of the SA and AV node conduction. Um, however, a beta blocker plus a DHP makes perfectly good sense. One works on the heart, one works on the blood vessels. If they require a third agent there, that's where you got to consider further workup, like angiography or something like that. 
Now, in terms of anti-platelet effects here, this is going to be beneficial to prevent an actual blockage from happening. Uh, Savannah is asking, so do people who have angina or ischemia typically just get put on an ACE inhibitor as prophylaxis or support? Um, most of the time, yes, um, because we know the fact that um, they're at risk for these developments down the line. It's probably just best to put them on one. Um, that's why you're going to see in a lot of cases, most patients probably need to be on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, depending on uh, which one they can tolerate there. So, um, again, unless it's just simple hypertension where that's the only issue they have, then an ACE may not be the best option for them, right? So, um, you know, if you have like a black patient who has just hypertension and nothing else, then something like, you know, a thiazide might be a better option to go with or, or a calcium channel blocker. Um, in terms of antiplatelet drugs, again, these are helpful for preventing clots from forming um, that lead to that acute ischemia there. And so these can either be used chronically for prevention of acute coronary syndromes, or if they're having an acute coronary syndrome, again, they can be useful in order to prevent further um, platelet aggregation from happening here. The things like aspirin are used most commonly. If you have a patient who cannot tolerate aspirin, then something like clopidogrel can be used uh, remember that's an EDP receptor blocker. Different mechanism tends to be just as effective, but um, may have a little bit worse bleeding profile. So, you know, if patient can tolerate aspirin, just have them take that. Baby aspirin a day is totally fine. So, unless there's a contraindication for patients with angina, give them aspirin. Give them a beta blocker if they have a pre previous MI, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, give them an ACE inhibitor if they have any kind of LV dysfunction or diabetes. And they probably need to be on some sort of lipid lowering therapy, right? Because remember, we talked about the pleiotropic effects of statins and how they help to stabilize plaques or antioxidant, all that good stuff. They need to be on some sort of statin, most likely. And again, um, angina is a atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease equivalent, right? So if they have um, angina, they need to be on high intensity statins, right? Baseline. Um, so all these drugs, and then a sublingual nitro for quick relief. All these other ones are either for prevention of progression of disease, prevention of symptoms. This is the only one they use for acute treatment, sublingual nitro, okay? Um, if, again, if they're having daily or more frequent symptoms, that's where you consider prophylaxis with beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and your long-acting nitrates, okay? Now, again, they may already be on a beta blocker for the MI, so that kind of performs double duty there, which is... Now, for patients with variant angina, I mentioned more to that vasospastic sort of effect. Giving them a calcium channel blocker or a nitrate can be very beneficial for them. Basically prevents the vasospasm from clamping down on those vessels there. In fact, beta blockers may actually lead to worsened symptoms, so don't use beta blockers for that particular case of angina. All right. So let's say we have someone who has a history of angina, and now they're progressing, and now they're, they have an acute coronary syndrome. They took their dose of nitroglycerin, did not fix their symptoms, and now we think they're having ACS. What do we do for those patients? And of course, um, ACS can be classified a couple different ways. So we can talk about STEMIs, um, which are going to be more of like an, a kind of a complete blockage of the coronary vessels versus an end STEMI, which can be broken down into unstable angina, which is basically means symptoms at rest, or an end STEMI itself, which is you know more dictated based off of um, you know, enzymes and, and the actual physical findings there during the cath, for instance. So what we're going to see here is this thrombus formation occurs um, either due to, say, like a plaque rupturing or something like that leading to, or maybe a vessel injury, for instance, leading to the clotting cascade being activated along with platelet activation. So what you can see here is that by this collagen being exposed, either due to thrombus rupture or something like that, you're going to be getting a lot of different things all happening at once. So basically the platelets are going to start to aggregate. They get activated through thromboxane and ADP. Um, so that causes them to all start to clump up at the site. You also are going to get things like tissue factor activating your clotting cascade, causing thrombin to be formed, right? Again, don't forget all the stuff we learned two tests ago um, for the, from the first one where we covered all of our hemo, um, or, uh, excuse me, our anticoagulant drugs. But we're going to see here that we kind of need to focus on both pathways here because not only are platelets aggregating, but then you have the fibrin being formed here that causes everything to sort of cement up, right? So for patients who are having an acute coronary syndrome, frequently they're going to be getting antiplatelet therapy in addition to anticoagulant therapy in order to prevent this thrombus from getting any worse, okay? So if patients are having acute coronary syndrome, what do we want to do for them? Obviously, reestablish nor normal coronary blood flow, relieve their chest pain. If they're not having an MI right now, prevent them from developing one. 
And then once they're through that, try to prevent development of heart failure. Because again, all that ischemic tissue, once it starts to die off, it doesn't really contract very much anymore. It doesn't conduct electricity very well anymore. It does not um, allow for good contractility and all of that. So heart failure is frequently preceded by an MI. So we want to prevent that and then prevent death from occurring as well. So common things we're going to do for patients who are having acute coronary syndrome. Uh, first off, get the antiplatelet therapy started quickly, right? So most of these patients um, probably had a risk for ACS in the first place. So they probably had some aspirin around. Have them chew up 481 milligram aspirins or that 325, whatever. That's the dose they want to get there because we see if you get that on board early, it helps to stop um, platelet aggregation and it reduces mortality and reinfarction. Very good there. Um, I'm sure most of you have probably heard the acronym MONA-B, which stands for morphine, oxygen, nitrates, aspirin, and beta blockers. Um, not every patient is going to get all five of those things. Most of them are probably going to get oxygen because it's easy to do. And of course, more oxygen is not a bad thing for those patients. Uh, almost all of them are going to get aspirin. But the other stuff is going to be more uh, on a case-per-case -case basis there. Okay, Not everyone's going to need morphine. Not everyone's going to need nitrates necessarily. Not everyone's going to get a beta blocker right away. Okay, um, So just keep that in mind. It's not like everyone gets all those five things all at once because there could be some things that may predispose them to not needing them or to that would actually be a bad idea. But anyway, so you have your patient getting their aspirin. They're having this chest pain there. Hopefully their nitrates are taking there. And that's not going to do anything for outcomes, but it does improve their chest pain. So it's only really for symptom relief. It does not have any benefits for reducing mortality, anything like that for this patient, just to make them feel better. And then we're going to see that beta blockers are very handy because they reduce risk of MI um, and they can decrease mortality from MI. Um, however, if a patient's coming in and they're already bradycardic or hypotensive, you don't want to add on a beta blocker right there. Okay. You can do that in the next couple of days as they're recovering from their cabbage or PCI, whatever they end up getting there. Um, so beta blockers not necessary right away, but they do need to be on them at some point. So aspirin, obviously, you want to be careful there um, in terms of if they have an allergy to it, any kind of recent bleeding, like GI bleed, intracranial hemorrhage, or something like that. Um, again, if they have an aspirin allergy, use clopidogrel as an alternative. Some kind of ATP receptor blocker can be beneficial there. If they have the recent bleed, then again, you want to be very cautious. I'd be certainly conferring with your, um, uh, your cardiology uh, you know, specialists there to give you a good idea of what to do because, again, you have to mitigate the risk for bleeding while also making sure you're establishing good coronary blood flow for them, right? So, as I mentioned, nitrates typically are starting sublingual for the most part until they get into the hospital. If they're still really hypertensive, then you can try using something like an IV infusion, but um, that is sort of, uh, again, only to treat the blood pressure and to provide relief to the patient. It's not going to do anything, again, for their survival there. Um, again, the problems are going to be things like hypotension, headache, and reflex tachycardia. Patients are probably going to be tachycardic to begin with, but they might not be. But also, if you increase their heart rate, that increases O2 demand, right? So again, that's obviously the problem they're already having in the first place. These are contraindicated if, they, again, they're hypotensive or if they're on one of those PDE inhibitors like Viagra, like I mentioned before. Do not mix those two together because they will bottom out their pressure and you've got a whole new host of problems to deal with. Again, just for relief, no mortality benefits. Now, beta blockers, again, you can start off with IV treatment here, followed by PO. If they are hypotensive, if they're bradycardic, don't use a beta blocker, right? Because they don't need that. It's just going to worsen those effects there. Um, they have reactive airway disease. Use a first, uh, use a cardioselective beta blocker. Again, make sure you um, ask that history, right? History is really important for these patients to make sure you're picking the right agents here. And then uh, by using a beta blocker, we do see reduction in mortality we see a decrease in heart failure really good to get on board but again be cautious you don't use it on every single patient walks to the door because of their hypotensive bradycardic not a good drug for them now morphine I talk about morphine a lot um part of that mona acronym there there's nothing special about morphine it could be any opioid analgesic um, the only benefit to this is it provides additional chest pain relief if nitrates are not responsive so not every patient with acs has to get an opioid, right? Um, and in fact, the fewer opioids you can give during your career, probably the better off you're going to be. Um, but if they are getting nitrates and their chest pain is still, um, say, you know, they're coming in a complete 10 out of 10 chest pain, they're on nitroglycerin and it's only bringing it down to a nine, then something like morphine can be beneficial to help bring that down even further, hopefully. So um, 
Again, if they're not having any pain, if they're comfortable, don't give them morphine. They don't need it, right? So just be aware of that. Think about the clinical sort of context there. Now, morphine itself can lead to some allergy, can lead to some hypotension. Uh, it has to do with histamine release, uh, which we can talk about at a later time, but we'll get into all of our opioids uh, next semester in much more detail. So if you have that clot there, you know, what can we do to try to get rid of it, right? So you can be starting up your antiplatelet drugs. Um, you're going to be hooking up things like your heparin drips and things like that to try to prevent any further clot progression. But if we want to get rid of that clot directly, what could we do? Uh, Paige is asking, uh, does ASA help break platelets apart once they aggregate or only stop them from doing so in the first place? It only prevents them from clumping up together in the first place, right? So if they've already had that conformational shift and if they're already, uh, all that fibrinogen is already holding them in place at the site of injury, um, then aspirin is not going to do a lot for that. Um, that's why you want them to take it immediately. So that way they can get that on board and try to prevent any further play of the aggregation from occurring or try to at least mitigate it as best you can. Okay. So in order to get rid of that whole plug altogether, that's where our fibrinolytics come into play here. And so this is not done as commonly as it used to be for acute coronary syndromes because the access to cath labs is shown to be safer and also more effective in a lot of cases here. Um, however, this is a good spot to talk about them because I don't really have anywhere else to bring up the fibrinolytics here. But basically, if you're looking at the clotting cascade, ultimately, what does the clotting cascade do but form factor 2A that converts fibrinogen into fibrin? And we know fibrin to be that sort of that uh, liquid cement that just holds all those platelets in place uh, to form a stable clot. And so basically, in order to get rid of fibrin, we have to have a means of breaking it down, right? And so this is where the product called plasmin comes into play here. And basically, we need to find some way to convert plasminogen over to plasmin, okay? Um, your body can do this naturally, but we want to find some ways we can do this artificially in order to get rid of that clot if need be. Okay. And so, um, typically what our body has is something called tissue plasminogen activator or TPA. And so that's something our body naturally produces to get rid of plasmin, uh, like it normally would. However, we can actually give additional TPA as we'll see here in order to help lyse that fibrin, get rid of fibrinogen, actually inactivate several clotting factors. Okay. So, um, there's a few you may run into, things like TPA, uh, tissue plasminogen activator, redoplace, and then tenecteplase. I personally have seen mostly TPA being used. I'll talk about some other indications for here in, in a little bit. They all have very similar responses and adverse effects as we're going to see. What's the main adverse effect? Bleeding. Uh, if you ever want to see some very uh, dangerous drugs or drugs that people are very freaked out about giving, especially big systemic doses, it's going to be fibrinolytics. As you want to give it to them to prevent that clot from occurring, and again, you may be using this for ischemic strokes, you may be using this for um, very severe PEs, you may be using this for MIs in rare instances. Um, whenever you give it though, it's very scary because again, you know where the patient has an acute clot, um, but you're giving this drug that can cause them to bleed out all over the place. And so major bleeding, um, hemorrhagic stroke, um, peritoneal bleeding, all these things can occur here. And so you want to be very cautious and make sure you're not going to give it to someone who is at too big of a risk for bleeding. The contraindications are extremely important here. You want to know about these. Okay? So bleeding is very important, which makes sense based off the mechanism. Um, you also can see some anaf um, allergic reactions to this, right? It has to do um, with a couple agents we don't use too frequently here in the U.S., like streptokinase and urokinase, but you can see some fevers and chills because these are recombinant proteins that we're giving to patients, so you can have a reaction there. Uh, rarely do you have anaphylaxis, but that'd be kind of a bummer if you have someone who's having a massive PE and they got anaphylaxis to treat on top of that, but it can occur. And then ventricular arrhythmias are also a risk as well. So contraindications are very important here. So if they've had surgery in the past 10 days, don't give them any more fibrinolytics, okay? And again, when you're doing this clinically, um, we don't expect any providers to memorize this um, in the heat of the moment when you have a you know a patient who's crashing right in front of you. Um, typically, we have a checklist that we go through. We have papers available to help us out with this. But I want you guys to know at least some of the major contraindications, um, be able to recognize those on a test, right? So that way you can say whether a patient be a good candidate or not for a fibrinolytic. Um, so if surgery in the past 10 days, they've had serious GI bleeding in the past three months, they have a history of hypertension and notice here, this is diastolic pressure above 110, not systolic. And so this is something that's a bit of a, uh, more of a flexible one because you can 
give them medications to get the blood pressure down. So for instance, if I have someone who comes in and they have a systolic of a diastolic of 110, I can give them something like labetalol or a calcium channel block or something like that, or get the pressure down. And if you can get that diastolic down below 110, then you're okay to go ahead and give it at that point. That was one thing to note there. If they have any active bleeding or hemorrhagic disorder, skip these drugs because the bleeding risk is too high. Uh, any kind of previous cerebrovascular accidents or intracranial processes, so if they have like tumors or something like that, don't do that. Aortic dissection, acute pericarditis, or if they have any kind of previous allergic reaction. Uh, this one, I wouldn't worry so much about the streptokinase because we don't use it much in the U.S. here, but any previous allergic reaction, which makes sense, and then pregnancy, do not want to give it. So if they meet any of these contraindications, you don't, just don't get the fibrinolytic. Okay? And again, because these drugs are pretty serious and kind of dangerous for purposes of MI, this is why we try to get them to the cath lab because we see that the door to balloon time um, is a much better outcomes than if they actually have to get the fibrinolytic. But who knows, maybe you're gonna be working out in the sticks somewhere, you have no access to um, a cath lab and this is what you gotta do, then that might be the case. So um, with Alteplase, again, this is a recombinant protein that we're making here that directly converts that fibrin uh, over into um, uh, breakdown products, right? Converts plasminogen to plasmin, which breaks down the fibrin. Um, I don't really care if the, you know it comes from Chinese hamster ovary cells. I just find it interesting. That's what they use to actually produce it. Um, these drugs tend to be pretty expensive for the most part because they are, they're proteins being made here. I will tell you that um, much more commonly, what you're gonna see TPA being used for is actually to treat um, intracatheter clots. So if you have a patient who has an IV in place um, for a long time, uh, IV in place for like I said, days or weeks, or maybe they have like an implanted port or a central line that's in place or something like that. Sometimes blood can pool there and can clot off. Now, normally we use drugs like heparin to try to prevent that from occurring, but it still happens, right? And so more, more frequently what you're gonna find for patients that are in a hospital, you'll be ordering TPA that can be applied directly into the catheter itself to break down any uh, clots that are there, and that way you don't have to get the line out and replace it, okay? Um, it can be either technically challenging or just um, infeasible to switch out a line, especially if it's like a central line. And so if you can save that line by getting that clot uh, gone, then that is gonna be preferable. So this is where I use TPA quite frequently on the inpatient side. But again, massive PEs, uh, ischemic strokes, uh, some MIs, um, these fibrinolytics are gonna be useful there. Again, red place to nectar place, they all act very similar to one another. Um, mechanisms are all, if you just know that it converts um, plasminogen to plasmin, which breaks down fibrin, you're good. You're good to go in terms of mechanism there. So they all work very similar to one another. Um, again, also look at your indications in terms of time too. We mentioned time is tissue. And so typically for especially uh, patients under 75, it, if they know when their symptom onset was, it's within 12 hours. And yeah, it makes sense to go ahead and give it for something like ACS. However, we do find that the older they get, the uh, more likely they are to bleed. And then the longer they are from the onset of uh, the condition, we're gonna see that that actually reduces the effectiveness of the drug as well. So there's a lot of reasons not to give this, a lot of reasons just to get them to the cath lab if you can, but at least you wanna know in, uh, where you're gonna be using these drugs here, why you might see them being used, um, so that way you're at least aware of it. Uh, let's just say, do patients not experience any effects when you add a fibrinolytic just to the cath? Um, that's a good question there. So I don't normally talk about that a lot. So, so, so let's just talk about intracatheter uh, fibrinolysis. And so the benefit to doing that is you get a very directed application of the drug directly to where the blockage is. And so you're using the amount of drug you're using is, is much, much less. And so the risk for bleeding is also much, much less. And so that's really a benefit of doing that intracatheter fibrinolysis. So whether they go through, um, you know, some places will do balloons. If you're doing like a stroke or something, maybe you'll do intracatheter um, fibrinolysis, but it depends on what your access is to, um, you know, specialists, right? Do you have, you know, neurology in-house 24 seven that can do this, or is it an interventional radiology? A lot of different things that uh, depend on, on that, but yeah, uh, you have fewer side effects because you're applying it directly within a very small area. The dose you're using is much, much smaller, right? Um, just to give you an example um, of a dose difference there, if you were to do Alteplase or TPA for um, a line occlusion, for instance, for an intracatheter line occlusion, it's like one milligram that you're giving, one to two milligrams. 
Um, on the other hand, though, if you're doing out to place or something like um, an acute ischemic stroke, you're giving like upwards of like 100 milligrams. That's like a systemic dose that you might give there. Um, so you can see kind of the difference there between um, your dosing if you're doing something within the catheter, directly going to treat a very acute sort of thing versus if you're giving it systemically uh, for, for the same problem there. So a good, good point you make there. Other agents we might be using uh, depend on sort of the situation. Uh, so for instance, like glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors, like um, uh, the Angiomax we talked about, you know, bivalorudin, um, things like that may be useful. Um, I'm sorry, not bivalorudin, thinking uh, abseximab uh, can be useful here for, again, preventing um, aggregation of platelets in addition to things like ADP receptor antagonists, in addition to things like heparins and whatnot. Um, so again, you'll frequently see multiple drugs being used together and again, all of that just increases your bleeding risk, which again may preclude you from using something like a fibrinolytic, like uh, TPA, for instance. Okay, so that's it for the main drugs we see for acute coronary syndrome. Um, again, if you get into um, the specifics between treating like uh, non-STEMI versus STEMI, um, you can get more into granular detail about what you're going to be using there. Um, typically, if you are, for instance, like the um, ERPA, and you're working and you're calling up like your cardiology uh, group to get them over to the cath lab. Frequently, you're going to ask them, hey, what do you guys want me to put them on? Do you guys want them to be on a heparin drip? You want them to get some clopidogrel, you know, or there'll be um, uh, not guidelines necessarily, but clinical pathways in place. So that way you'll have an idea of what already to have the patient on. Um, so that's a really important thing to consider because, again, time is tissue. So you want to get them um, in and out of the ER very quickly, get them over to the cath lab for more definitive care. Okay. Um, so moving on, let's talk about heart failure for a bit here. Um, so again, why do people develop heart failure? Well, it was probably because they had an MI, right? So we had a patient who started off with hypertension, then he developed angina, and now he had an MI, now he's got THF, right? So you can kind of see the clinical progression to kind of have gone through these different drug classes here. And we're going to see again how many of them are reused from condition to condition in order to help manage these patients chronically here. Again, most cases of uh, MI, or I'm sure most cases of CHF are as a result of MI, but there are other reasons too, right? You can have certain toxins, uh, certain chemotherapy drugs that can lead to CHF. Um, a lot of reasons for this, right? Um, so just be aware that not everything is an MI, but again, that's an important history to, to consider. So what happens with patients um, with heart failure where they can have either systolic, diastolic, or both the dysfunctions uh, on, on both sides of the equation there. From a systolic standpoint, this is typically due to decreased contractility of the left ventricle, right? Imagine you have an MI and you necrosed a big area of that, uh, that left ventricle, because again, that's the most octave, octave, the most oxygen active area of the heart, because it has the most work to do. Um, you're going to lose that muscle mass. You're going to see as a response to that, the left ventricle is going to start to hypertrophy, uh, and you can end up finding the walls get very thick, uh, they get very non compliant, um, and that's going to reduce the ability for the heart to pump very effectively or efficiently. And so you can notice here, you're gonna have a reduced ejection fraction associated with that. From a, a diastolic standpoint, it's gonna be due to this impaired relaxation. Again, due to the left ventricle getting more um, thick and less compliant, it can't relax very well. And so because it cannot relax, in order to fill up with blood, um, you're gonna find it's more of a diastolic issue. So as you can see here with the systolic problems, is a decreased contractility with impaired relax or diastolic issues. It's more of impaired relaxation. Okay. Again, oftentimes systolic dysfunction can lead to diastolic function over time, as you'll see, especially if you lead like, um, if you're talking about in terms of like left sided versus right sided heart failure, typically left sided leads to right sided. So anyway, so you're going to end up finding, um, overall you're going to get decreased ventricular filling, which reduces your cardiac output over time. Okay even though their ejection fraction might be okay, if they have isolated dystolic dysfunction, overall the filling is not gonna be very good. And so because of that, the body wants to compensate, right? Cardiac output's down. This is how can we um, deal with this? And so it does things like trying to increase preload, right? So it wants to get more blood volume in order to get more volume returning to the heart. And so it's gonna do things like increase renin release, Going to hold on to more sodium or water. It's also going to try to do things like increase the afterload by increasing vasoconstriction. And so um, that just worsens things. It just worsens things overall. So it's sort of a, a sick cycle that you see there where decreased cardiac output leads to compensatory mechanisms that further diminish cardiac output, uh, which is why these patients get into so much trouble over time. 
And that decompensation is really the thing we worry about because this is what leads them to end up in the hospital uh, or in the ERs because they have a, an acute decompensation in their LV function. They cannot perfuse the body very well, and that leads them to seek out care. And so it could be related to the lack of compliance with their medication regimen or their diet regimens. Um, if they have an arrhythmia that goes along with that, and again, arrhythmia is typically um, can occur as a result of MI because you kind of necrosed off that tissue and it's all just scar tissue now. Um, or if they have things like fluid overload. So a lot of things can precede these decompensations. And so the management of chronic hypertension versus an acute decompensation may be a little different. We'll look at some ways we can do that. In terms of non-pharmacologic therapy, uh, it's really important to get their fluid and their dietary salt restriction in place uh, because that is going to prevent them from kind of getting overloaded. And where does that fluid like to go? Uh, what likes to hang out in the peripheral tissue? That's where you get peripheral edema. It also likes to hang out in the lungs as well. So that's why when you listen to them, they're in acute decompensation on the lungs. You're going to hear a bunch of crackles and whatnot. So that fluid is just kind of sitting there, right? Um, again, physical activity is good for them. But they may find that they have impaired physical activity because they have a harder time getting the heart to pump blood to where it's needed to go. Um, but overall, if they can do more physical activity overall, that's going to help their functional status. So let's look at the pharmacotherapy that we have for heart failure. First thing up is going to be our diuretics. Um, you're going to see that with thiazide diuretics, these are good for patients with hypertension, but if they're having fluid overload due to um, kind of cardiovascular backup due to LV and, uh, and our right ventricular dysfunction, um, it's not really going to be good for that. So if you have patients who have put on like 10 pounds in the past couple of days, and it's all fluid, thiazides are really not going to do a whole lot good there. That's where your loop diuretics are sort of the mainstay of therapy. The loop diuretics are very effective, like furosemide, bumetanide, torsemide. They're going to be able to provide good symptomatic benefits by getting rid of that extra weight, that extra fluid that they've been holding on to as a result of cardiovascular congestion. So this is why you tell them to weigh themselves every day because you want to make sure that you see if they're going up, say, like over a pound a day over several days, um, that, that they should know that that's probably going to be related to fluid buildup. Um, again, loop directions from the mainstay in order to get rid of that fluid there. Now, we're going to talk about drugs that are good for symptomatic management and then drugs that are good for mortality benefits. Diuretics are only going to be good for the symptomatic management. No one's going to be living for longer because they're on furosemide, um, but it will help them to get that fluid off and feel better. Okay, so if they're not having issues of acute fluid buildup, then they may not necessarily need to take furosemide or another loop diuretic every single day. Right, so you can have instances where a patient is on maybe as needed loop diuretics. Right, so we call that a strategy called pill in a pocket, where they realize, hey, if my weight goes up by this much for this many days, then I'll go ahead and take some of my water pills, right? They're, they're loop diuretics. On the other hand, though, you have some patients who are kind of chronically fluid overloaded and they may be on Lasix twice daily for every day from here on till, till they're dead, right? So it just depends on sort of the situation there. It's not mandatory. On the other hand, though, things like ACE inhibitors will be mandatory for these patients here because they work to decrease preload, afterload, they decrease sympathetic nervous system activation, and they overall help slow down progression of left ventricular dysfunction, right? They prevent hypertrophy, dilation, remodeling. It doesn't reverse anything, but it does slow it down, right? So an overall decrease in mortality. So these are really kind of mandatory therapy for these patients. If they can't tolerate an ACE, do an ARB, right? This is gonna be very good for them overall, so this is why you wanna make sure they're on it. And not only that, but you also see things like less hospitalizations, um, which means that they are, um, you know, not, uh, creating as much financial burdens for themselves or for society. They live for longer, so maybe they can be productive. So there's a societal benefit to these people living for longer, not just either they feel better or they um, have their, their disease state under control, right? So a lot of benefits to these. Um, be aware of ACE inhibitors in patients who um, have impairment of renal function, because remember, ACEs can cause an acute decrease there, but again, chronically, it can be okay. And then again, start low and go slow if you need to, if you have patients of existing kidney disease. Um, watch their blood pressure. Watch their potassium. We know ACE inhibitors are going to be increasing that, right? Um, and again, these are patients who are frequently on diuretics as well. So you really got to watch the potassium there, especially that history like arrhythmias or something. So know which drugs are going to be decreasing the potassium, which ones are increasing potassium, and know which, when you're playing with those, kind of which ones are going to make that better or worse. So if I give you a test question, I give, uh, say, the patient has low potassium, which one of these drugs would be contraindicated? 
then you would say something like a loop diuretic, for instance, versus if they have a high potassium, then you would say something like an ACE inhibitor might be contraindicated, okay? So just be aware of that to make sure you can get the uh, straight in your mind of which ones are gonna cause lower potassium levels, which one cause higher potassium levels. Uh, beta blockers are also really important for CHF as well, because these also provide mortality benefits. Um, now there's three that fit into this category and this is gonna include carvedilol, Metoprolol XL, which is metoprolol succinate, the long-acting form, and then bisoprolol. Those are the three main ones that are indicated for uh, mortality benefits and heart failure. And you're saying to yourself, well, wait a second. Beta blockers decrease LV uh, contractility. Why would I give this to someone with depressed left ventricular contractility? And you're right. That can actually cause an acute decompensation. And you have to be really careful with beta blockers in patients with heart failure. But... What you find is, is by starting a very low dose, usually in the hospital where you can monitor them and then gradually increasing them over the course of six to eight weeks or so, you can really cause um, some improvements in terms of mortality, in terms of symptom management, okay? But you gotta start low and go extremely slow with these because otherwise you can put them into a decompensation, okay? Uh, so as I mentioned with benefits here, you're getting improved exercise tolerance, you're getting better hemodynamic improvements and overall slowed disease progression, helping these patients live for longer, hopefully not needing a transplant, less hospitalizations, all of that. So um, these should be first-line therapy for anyone class two to four heart failure. Most patients will probably fit into one of these categories there, okay? And they definitely need to be on an ACE inhibitor irrespective of symptoms, okay? So again, uh, loop diuretics, symptom management. ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, mortality benefits, what we're using for, right? have them have them live for longer. Um, next, I want to talk about digoxin briefly. This is something I've kind of mentioned uh, several times in the past. This is the first time we're actually talking about it specifically. And so this is actually uh, kind of looks a little bit like a steroid if you look at the structure here. Um, it actually comes from a lot of plant sources. So if you've ever heard of um, oleanders or lily of the valley or different uh, plants like that, this is where we get digoxin-like compounds. And so digoxin uh, kind of has a couple of different actions here, but the main mechanism for it is it decreases the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase pump. So imagine this is a myocyte here, and you have the sodium potassium pump. And recall that this pump normally keeps cells at a resting membrane potential. They bring in two potassium for every three potassium to kick out, and this keeps the resting membrane potential intact here, okay? Well, what happens if I decrease the activity of this enzyme, right? So this transporter is not working so much. This means that I'm going to get a relatively high amount of potassium outside of the cell. I'm going to get a lot of sodium inside of the cell. And this is going to cause this transporter to work more quickly because the cell says I have too much sodium. So let's get rid of that. So it's going to get more sodium out of the cell. It's going to bring in more calcium because this is an antiporter. And this is going to lead to increased calcium concentrations here, okay? Increased calcium causes more calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which leads to more muscle contraction. So digoxin is a positive inotrope because it allows for the heart to beat more uh, forcefully, right? As a result of more calcium being brought in the cell. So um, that's kind of the old way we thought it was used for. We thought it was great because it increased contractility of the muscle. We thought this is good for patients with CHF. Now we start to realize that it has probably more to do with what we call these neurohormonal effects here. And so this has to do with things like affecting the sympathetic and uh, parasympathetic nervous system, overall decreasing sympathetic activity. It's also useful for resensitizing the baroreceptor reflex, right? Baroreceptors are pressure detecting receptors. And if they detect low pressure, then they try to get that pressure back up. As I mentioned last time, that patients with chronic hypertension, their receptors have resensitized to having, you know, 180 over 100 be their new normal. And so if we can resensitize that, it allows for them to say, okay, well, lower pressures are okay. Let's bring that pressure down closer to 120 over 80, or at least less than 130 over 80. And then it also depresses the renin angiotensin system. All these things are very good because they're gonna be helpful um, with symptom management that may be a little bit beneficial from, um, probably not necessarily from a mortality standpoint, but beneficial from the symptomatic management um, for sure. So as I mentioned here, blocking the sodium potassium pump here helps reset the baroreceptor reflex, so it leads to less heart rate. You're also gonna see more parasympathetic activity, meaning more acetylcholine on those muscarinic receptors, so it decreases heart rate there, and then overall less blood pressure or lower blood pressure and better cardiac output, okay? So a lot of things it's doing is good. You're also gonna see less renal angiotensin system, 
uh, less remodeling, better perfusion of tissues. Um, so it sounds great, right? It sounds like every patient should be on digoxin. However, it's a very narrow therapeutic index. Digoxin can be a very dangerous drug if used in the wrong hands. You can see here how narrow of an index it is, 0.5 to 1 nanograms per ml, right? Most drugs are in micrograms per ml, concentrations in nanograms, a very small amount. Don't memorize the level here. If I give you a question on a test, it'll, I'll give you the normal range, but I'll tell you what the patient's actual level is, and you might make a determination based off of that, but don't memorize this number necessarily. But what you find is higher concentrations actually lead to worsen outcomes for those patients. There. So what benefits do we get? We see improvement in symptoms, better exercise tolerance, quality of life better, decreased hospitalizations, but no survival benefit has been found yet. Right. So this is not mandatory therapy for patients with heart failure, but it may be an add on if they are on their ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, loop diuretic, and maybe they need some additional symptom management. Then something like um, a, uh, you know, digox may be useful for those patients there. Right. So as I mentioned, does not slow disease progression, but only beneficial for symptomatic management and patients optimize on everything else. Okay. Uh, they have concomitant uh, atrial fibrillation because we'll talk about digoxin again in terms of its use as an antiarrhythmic, then that may also be beneficial. So if heart failure plus atrial fibrillation, then that may be a good combination. So why don't we like it? Why don't why is it not great? Well, the, the toxicities are kind of the problem here. So from a GI standpoint, I guess some nausea vomiting can be a little rough on the stomach here. Interestingly, there's a lot of other side effects that are sort of unique to digoxin. So for instance, here are visual disturbances, which are sort of, sort of unique. You can end up having sort of blurred vision and photophobia. You may start to see like yellow green uh, halos around lights. That's very indicative of having too high of a digoxin level. You definitely wanna be very aware of that and get that checked out. Um, that's called xanthopsia, which means like a, z a yellowing of the vision, right? So definitely unique to there. Um, you also get some central symptoms here, like, you know, dizziness, confusion, and whatnot. Um, but the cardiac stuff is really the more dangerous thing, right? No one's going to die from seeing yellow lights. However, that may be um, a bad portent of the cardiac effects that may be coming here. And so basically, in how it's described to me, is it basically any arrhythmia on earth you can find with the jocks? And it's very sort of, um, uh, sort of unpredictable in terms of what effects it might actually have here. But sinus brady is probably the most common thing you're going to run into. Um, but certainly you can see a lot of like preventricular beats um, that can develop as well. It's going to be a sign uh, that's sort of irritating the heart from an electrophysiological standpoint. So you want to be careful, right? Because if they have advanced AV blocks, severe bradycardia, this is going to worsen that. So you don't want to do that. Um, you know, because it blocks the sodium potassium pump, it actually causes potassium levels outside of the cell to increase, which leads to hyperkalemia, right? So hyperkalemia can actually worsen their risk for developing arrhythmias as well. So you want to be really careful of those patients. Uh, to have hypercalcemia, hypomagnesemia, or Wolf Parkinson White can also predispose them to some arrhythmia. So these are all good contraindications to know because you'll be very careful using digoxin in these patients here. But what happens if you're having a patient who develops severe toxicity, right? So I've had patients who are elderly. Um, another thing to note with digoxin too is it's renally eliminated. And so if you have poor renal function, you can't clear it very well. And so I've had patients who um, had issues to where uh, they were dosing the medication, you know, for the long haul. They've been on it for months and months and months. And all of a sudden they have an acute decrease in their kidney function. And all of a sudden their, um, you know, digoxin levels are sky high, right? And so they get started getting these bradycardias, they get hypotensive. And like, what do we do for them? Well, we actually have an antidote for this. And so it's called digoxin immune fab. And so this is actually an antibody is produced by hyperimmunizing sheep to digoxin, right? It comes from ovine sources or sheep. And so basically you hyperimmunize the sheep you uh, to digoxin, you pull out the antibodies, isolate them, and then you can give them to the patient. The uh, patient will then have all their digoxin neutralized and then it reverses their toxicity. So again, this is a good one to know if you ever see an antidote for something, I'm probably gonna ask a question about it because I like antidotes and it's good to know what to do in a pinch, right? Someone having an acute ventricular arrhythmia due to digoxin, we want to be able to know how to treat that immediately, right? All right, a couple other classes of drugs here. We have our aldosterone antagonists. So we've talked about spironolactone and aplerolinone before. Um, there is some mortality benefit to aldosterone antagonists, but it's going to be relegated to stage three and four heart failure. So this is more for more progressive um, symptomatic patients here. Um, remember though, that these are going to be potassium sparing, right? So they increase potassium levels, 
So if they have kidney dysfunction, serum creatinine above 2.5, or if they have hyperkalemia, so need potassium greater than five, these are not eligible. So do not use these for patients that have a high potassium levels because we know it's gonna increase it even further, okay? And remember, gynecomastia can, can be seen in men due to the partial androgen receptor activity of spironolactone. This is gonna be much less so than in pluralinone. Um, some of this would be thought to cause decreased remodeling of the left ventricle by inhibiting aldosterone. Um, so there is some mortality benefit, but this is not something that every patient is gonna get, especially if their kidney function or potassium don't allow it. So um, then last couple things here, we have uh, some inotropic agents. So these are gonna be good drugs if patients are having acute decompensations. They're coming, they're hypotensive, they're tachycardic, they are, their extremities are cold, they are, are edematous. What can you do to try to perk up that cardiac output, right? A couple of drugs here we have including milrinone and enamrinone. And these are actually cyclo, um, sorry, phosphodesterase inhibitor three, uh, PDE3 inhibitors. So whereas with the medications for erectile dysfunction we saw were PDE5, this is actually PDE3. This has more specific effects on the heart. And so these work as both inotropes and vasodilators. So if you have someone, for instance, who comes in and they are um, acute decompensation, they're hypertensive and they're maybe you know tachycardic, but they just can't get that cardiac output up to really perfuse their blood pressures up, these drugs are pretty good for that because they're gonna allow for some vasodilation, but they also increase cyclic AMP in the heart that allows it to beat harder, positive inotropes. So they're gonna decrease afterload and increase cardiac output. Very beneficial from that standpoint. Um, we use this for acute decompensations just to kind of get their cardiac output up so they can perfuse. And then once they recover, once we get, once we diurese them, get rid of that fluid, then we want them to come off of it because we do see increased risk for arrhythmias and we actually see decreased mortality um, in the long term if you use this for too long. So typically short courses in the, um, in the ICU, in the, in the ER for the most part. Now on the other hand, there's a couple other agents we could use here as well. So things like dobutamine. Dobutamine is just a selective beta-1 agonist, so it directly affects beta-1 receptors, increased cardiac output. Um, I've probably seen this used a little bit more frequently than stuff like enamorone, but beneficial here. Notice it doesn't act as a vasodilator, so it doesn't really help out if your patient's hypertensive, like something like milrinone would. And then we have dopamine. This is another drug you're gonna see used as a vasopressor, meaning it helps to cause an increase in blood pressure. So if I had someone with an acute decompensation that needed an increase in cardiac output and they're hypotensive, dopamine's very good for that because it's gonna be able to squeeze down on the vessels and increase activity of the beta receptor on the heart to increase cardiac output, okay? Just a few agents you may see being used for decompensation on the inpatient side in order to help kind of get them stabilized. All right, so that's it for that section. I know it was quite a, a bit of stuff. Some of it was review though, right? It's just learning new ways to use drugs we covered in previous weeks. So uh, some review, which is probably good overall, but let me see uh, if we have any questions on the sticky board. I don't see anything. So um, that's it for me for today. We have, um, I think one more section of PowerPoints and then we're gonna have like a kind of a wrap up cardio section. Cause I think um, we'll run through a few cases and whatnot. I think it's important to review some of the stuff since it is, uh, it is complicated. Some people have a hard time with it. And then also um, we wanna make sure that, um, you know, kind of hammer home these points cause it is so important. And it's like so, so much of the test. Um, so that'd be kind of it for now. I did post a uh, prescription assignment for you all. So you have two weeks to work on that. Uh, if you have any questions, certainly let me know uh, if anything comes up though. And otherwise um, you guys are free for the week and I will see you next time. I'll hang out for a minute or two to see if you guys have any questions that pop up though. All right, doesn't seem like it, so I will let you guys go, and I'll see you next time.